London's Theatreland, a buzzing, thriving community in the heart of the West End. A melting pot of tourists, theatregoers, hawkers, and of course, actors. But way before my time, there was one man more than any other whose name was synonymous with the profession that is my life. He was hailed as a genius, a master of his art. And it was said of him also that he had no rival. At his best, when he really gave everything, there was just nobody who could match him. A man who delighted in reviews, hailing him as the best tragedian and comedian in England. He certainly wasn't backwards in coming forward. He was so well known. He was the George Clooney of his day. Ah. This made him legendary. Yes. That man was David Garrick. At the height of his fame in the mid-18th century, David Garrick was the most famous actor the world had ever seen. As both manager of the Theatre Royal, Drury Lane, and its star performer, he was the undisputed lord and master of the British stage. In my career, I've had the privilege of working with great names like Olivier and Gilbert, but though in his time Garrick was at least as famous, I didn't know much about him. I want to uncover the secret of Garrick's immense success, go behind his theatrical mask, get to grips with his acting technique, and find out how a penniless young man from the provinces became a national cultural icon. Walk down London's Garrick Street, and you will come to the Garrick Club, a private members club established in 1831 and named in Garrick's honour. It is one of the oldest, most prestigious private clubs in the capital, and a veritable shrine to Garrick. Dr Moira Goff is the librarian. You do. Welcome Thank to you. the Garrick Club Library. Thank you. Do come and have a look at some of the things that we have out. All to do with oh, Garrick. These look very pretty. So we what? have some memorabilia. What is there? Yes, two hands, I think. Oh. It's a powder puff. Like a bellows? Yes, it? it is. Can you imagine Garrick sitting in his dressing room with a cape over his shoulders and a mask, somebody behind him puffing powder onto his wig before he gets ready to go on stage? Well, he's still learning his lines. Yes. yes, very, mm. very likely. Yes. Amongst the trinkets and curios is a significant item key to unlocking Garrick's story. Goodman's Fields, October the 19th, 1741. Now, th this is the beginning of it all, isn't it? This is this, the playbill that announced the first appearance of Mr Garrick in an historical play called The Life and Death of King Richard III. The part of King Richard by a gentleman who never appeared on any stage. This was the legend. This made him legendary. This, this is where he bursts into public consciousness as, yes. as, the, as the great actor from the beginning, I think. Yeah, absolutely, yes, from yes, the very yes, beginning. Yes. I mean, the audiences raved. He suddenly became king of the theatre in one night. Why did they say a gentleman who never appeared on any stage? Was it a fail-safe thing? If, if I'm rotten, if I'm bad, it's yes, because I've never been on a stage. It's, you, if you make a mess of it and it doesn't happen, then you can withdraw gracefully because people don't really know who you are. Of course, with him, it has the opposite effect. He obviously made quite a stir. People would see this performance and they think, my God, for a beginner, he isn't half good. good yeah. Oh, well, I wonder what's going to happen next. And they tell their friends, and people start flocking um, yeah. to it. So that playbill of Garrick Richard III is one of the most important items in the whole of British theatrical history. Everybody raved about his performance. It was the most stunning debut on the London stage ever. But who was this gentleman? who has never appeared on any stage. I'm meeting Ian Kelly, a fellow actor, author, and a long-time Garrick admirer. Ian, I want to talk to you about uh, the man Garrick, 
Not, not particularly the actor, but where he came from, who he was. Amazingly, this sort of superstar of the 18th century comes from um, a small provincial town. Yes. Um, and he's, he's born in Hereford, but he's brought up in Lichfield and uh, part of a very sort of um, uh, small town world that becomes even smaller in a sense because he ends up at this minuscule little school with less than a dozen pupils but their teacher um, is Samuel Johnson and uh, this is the beginnings of uh, one of the most important friendships of that era yes. or maybe any era. I mean, they're a very odd couple all, all round, Sam Johnson and David Garrick, because Garrick is this, is this lithe um, little fella, um, uh, febrile, charming, handsome, quick-witted, quick of movement. Very short, very small, I hear. Um, Do you know his exact height? We, we think about five foot four. Five foot. He's a wee fella. He's a wee fella. Um, and his boon companion, Sam Johnson, this lumbering hulk of a man, as he was described, and when exactly they hatch a plot to, as it were, run away to London, we don't know, but they, but they do. And by repute, both of them, rather touchingly, with, as it were, half a play script um, under their arm. Oh, you literally. describe that journey. Uh, Garrick is about 20, and his former schoolmaster is about 27, 28. Um, and they come to London where they've got a single horse and sort of took turns to um, ride and walk. Uh, well, from one school. rode and tethered the horse mm -hmm. and walked on, then the second one who was walking, untethered it, got on it, and yeah. rode the thing off. On arrival in London, Garrick half-heartedly tried his hand as a lawyer. Then equally half-heartedly went into business with his brother as a wine merchant. But deep down, he was stage-struck and hankered after a life in the theater. Johnson, meanwhile, was convinced he was going to wow London audiences as a playwright. So you can imagine how he must have felt when his old pupil, Garrick, with his first ever play script, beat him to it. The play was called Lethe, a dramatic satire, first performed here at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane in 1740. What is remarkable is that Garrick's play gives us an extraordinary insight into the theatre of his day. Tell me, tell me about the, uh, the play that uh, Garrick wrote, uh, before he uh, was known, before he'd done his Richard III, uh, called Lethe. It was a satire, uh, the, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. So the, the central character is, is, is um, Aesop, and various characters come to see um, Aesop. There's a scene where um, it is the fine gentleman talking about the pleasures of his life and what he does. And there's one point where he talks about his stage um, experience and he talks about how he has gone on to the stage during the performance ah. as a member of the audience. I stand upon the stage, talk loud and stare about, which confounds the actors and disturbs the audience. Mm. Upon which the galleries, who hate the appearance of one of us, begin to hiss and cry, off, off while I, undaunted, stamp my foot so, loll with my shoulder thus, and take snuff with my right hand and smile scornfully <laughs> thus. This exasperates the savages, and they attack us with volleys of sucked oranges and half-eaten pippins. <laughs> <laughs> the whole theatre experience was different. So the audience behaviour, the audience expectation was completely different. Yeah. It was very much an interactive experience. And, and barracking... The, the actors was a big thing, where the premium yeah. seats are yeah. these days. But that was the pit then, that was bench seating. Yeah. And that would really be full of all the young dandies. They would be there to play cards with each other, to drink and carouse, to, to have a good time, to show off to, show, to other yes. people who were around. Yeah. Um, there would be prostitutes working yeah. the room down there as well. So and then, in it for the actors? Then, so even then, Garrick was obviously perturbed by the but, way yes. theatre worked, yeah. as somebody trying to break into it. Garrick's first ever play was a smash hit and became a staple of the 18th century theatre repertoire. But despite his success as a playwright, in his heart of hearts, Garrick still wanted to be an actor. However, he wouldn't be making his debut here at Drury Lane. As a novice, he would need to start at the bottom. At that time, 
There were only two official theatres here in London, Covent Garden and Drury Lane. All the rest operated on the margins of legality, a rather dubious and seedy existence. Plays were squeezed in between song recitals and rope dances. So it was at one of these less salubrious establishments, Goodman's Fields in the East End, that Garrick's career began. And he was going to have to work very hard to convince his family that acting was a reputable profession. Amazingly, the letters Garrick wrote home during his debut season at Goodman's Fields still survive and are kept here at the Victoria and Albert Museum. This is interesting. It's a letter from David to his brother Peter. My mind, as you must know, has always been inclined to the stage. I know you will be much displeased at me, yet I hope when you shall find that I may have the genius of an actor without the vices, you will think less severe of me and not be ashamed to own me for a brother. It's sad to think that our profession was for so long considered unacceptable. Now, it's wonderful that Garrick changed all that. Like him, I always wanted to go on the stage. I don't know why, I don't know where it came from. Some odd gene must have got in on the night of my conception. Um, but unlike Eric, I had huge support from my parents. Now here's another letter from Garrick. London, Tuesday night, my dear brother, as you finished your last letter with saying that you did not approve of the stage, yet you would always be my affectionate brother, I may now venture to tell you I am very near quite resolved to be a player. Now, there you go. now he goes on to say, I have the judgment of the best judges who, to a man, are of the opinion that I shall turn out Nay, they say I am not only the best tragedian, but comedian in England. He certainly wasn't backwards and coming forwards, but what he says is true. He was wowing the audience, packed houses, screaming for him. So what was it that Garrick was doing that was so very different? I'm intrigued. I really want to understand the technique of this charismatic performer. When Garrick arrived on the scene, the London stage was still dominated by a very formal style of acting that went back to the Restoration period. What went before him was declamation, decorum, beauty, ah. so that the whole thing was declaimed. Yeah. Now, I think what Garrick rediscovered is that basis of great acting, which is to surprise an audience. Ah, yeah. Changes of pace, really. Yeah. Pauses. Yeah. Garrick was brilliant at observing. And like a modern actor who's given a different... They might go and do some research in a particular environment. He would do that. So he's often described, for instance, if he's playing the part of a servant. Yeah. He's watched the way the man had been scratching his leg and use the same gesture. So he will borrow from real life. He will borrow. Oh, yes. I think, yes. I think actors are scavengers. <laughs> yeah, put it in the box of tricks. I mean, yes. it's, it's, um, it's very lovely to say, you know, it, it's art. Uh, it's craft. Mm. It's skill. Yeah. It's also tricks. Yes. And I'm sure Garrick was as tricky as anybody. He was, definitely. Yeah. So how natural was Garrick's naturalness? <laughs> For us, it probably wouldn't seem natural at all. Because when you look at the drawings of him and portraits of him, they're very statuesque poses. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The naturalness of Garrick comes from his emotional commitment and involvement. Did he not have a trick wig for Hamlet 
that he could make his hair stand on end. <laughs> he did, I think, for some performances, use that. The very first time he did Hamlet in the, uh, in the, 17, the 1740s. And it was an attempt... I mean, he was fascinated by modern studies of physiology. So what he wanted to try and communicate to people was that this sight made literally his hair stand on end. So he did that. He actually... The wig came up a bit and his hat fell off. But I don't think he always did that. Yeah. But at his best, when he really gave everything, there was just nobody who could yeah. match him. Less than a year after his debut on the seedy fringes of London theatre, the plucky young actor from the provinces went legit and took centre stage at one of the finest playhouses in the country, the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. In his first season, Garrick played King Lear, Hamlet, and by royal command, Richard III, British theatre had a new shining star. Garrick fever may have gripped the nation, but Garrick never allowed his head to be completely turned. He took his art very seriously and published an actor's guide to the craft. Garrick's essay on acting first appeared as a short sixpenny pamphlet uh, issued just before his own debut as Macbeth in 1744. The essay offers a wonderful insight into Garrick's move towards realism and a more natural way of acting. So, here we have the notes on how to act as Macbeth after murdering Duncan. He should, at that time, be a moving statue, or indeed, as a petrified man. His eyes must speak and his tongue be metaphorically silent. His attitude must be quick and permanent, his voice articulating, trembling, and confusedly intelligible. The murdered should be seen in every limb, and yet every member at that instant should seem separated from his body, and his body from his soul. This is the picture of a complete regicide. I mean, that's that, that quite extraordinary, uh, because he, he tabulates everything that should be done. He, he writes a list of what his eyes should be doing, his hands, his legs, his heart, which is his great, great weapon. Garrick put heart into it. Garrick put soul into it. This sounds like a terrible list of... Uh, uh, what to do with your, with your body, physically, what to do. But Garrick also added spirit, emotion, passion. That, that was new. Macbeth was one of many Shakespearean roles that Garrick made his own. I've come to his country residence in Hampton to meet Ian Kelly again, who wants to show me something that might help me understand Garrick's deep regard for Shakespeare. This is the, the, the temple to Shakespeare in the, the grounds of his villa. And it's very much in the spirit of the age that you would put in your garden some sort of folly uh, where one might contemplate um, the, the greatness of, uh, of the arts or the evanescence of life or whatever. But Garrick wanted to contemplate Shakespeare and have his guests do the same. So the great and the good uh, would come down the river and you would visit Hampton. Tell me about the, uh, the statue. It looks uh, like Shakespeare, but at the same time, it looks like it's too real to be Shakespeare. I mean, the, the bulging tummy and all that. Yeah, yeah, well, it, the truth of the story is that the body uh, is David Garrick, and oh. uh, the head is an idea of Shakespeare. So he, Garrick's almost, almost single-handedly revived Shakespeare and his reputation. And He's, he's huge he's in, in the, the process of that. It's partly to do with what's going on legally, because there is a theatre licensing act in 1737, and it requires every new play to be submitted to the Lord Chamberlain for censorship. And uh, as a result of this, there's a lot of new interest in, uh, in Shakespeare, but also, uh, and I think this is key to understanding Garrick's interest in Shakespeare, there was a growing awareness that he was a wonderful vehicle for the new style of acting and the new way of understanding performance. Uh, why then did uh, Garrick muck about with him so much? Um, I mean, he wrote scenes, or he changed the end of Lear, and, you know. Uh, why did he do that? It is, of course, 
ludicrous that we should have a happy ending Lear where Cordelia comes back to life. Yes. Um, or indeed a happy ending oh, Romeo really. and Juliet. Yeah. Um, however, he was sometimes using Shakespeare in different contexts because sometimes it would be the afterpiece for, it needed to be foreshortened to um, go at a different part in the evening. So there was a lot of reimagining of Shakespeare, um, which you could see as disrespectful, but was also part of the agenda that allowed it to be properly on the stage again. Also, he was responsible for putting Shakespeare in Stratford and His... anchoring him in Stratford. He hit upon the idea of putting on a, a, a jubilee, a sort of Shakespeare festival, in Stratford, with a vast rotunda, the first ever sort of festival theatre there. There were going to be fireworks and horse racing and balls and masquerade and a whole shebang. But something went wrong. It goes horribly wrong yes. for, for poor Garrick and everybody else who's traipsed out because a lot of the great and the good, hundreds of people turn up and all the, uh, the nobility of London um, arriving and it pours uh, with rain. It could not have been more of a um, disaster. But it wasn't the end. Garrick rewrote the pageant and put it on at Drury Lane, where it was a tremendous success, packing the houses and recouping his money four times over. So David Garrick wasn't only a great actor, he was a rather brilliant impresario. Garrick was 30 when, in 1747, he became joint manager of the Theatre Royal Drury Lane the scene of his many great dramatic triumphs. But it wasn't just acting that Garrick revolutionized, he also transformed the business of theater. First off was to clean up the rowdy behavior of the audience. He stopped um, people sitting on the stage so they didn't interrupt the action. Yeah. And um, he did away with the cheap admission halfway through the show. So that stopped that. And presumably that then had a big effect on the way people reacted to the drama and really set the tone for what is obviously our modern theatre. And, and focused it much more on the play, on the players. Um, he insisted on rehearsing. Yes, he? yeah, yeah. Well, introduced rehearsals. Garrick was um, not only very keen on, on changing the acting style and making the play the thing, if you yes. like to say. Introducing scenic effects, introducing costumes that made sense with the character and the action. Yes. And, and when he employed um, Philip de Lutherberg to come over. Oh, the designer. Before they'd be probably right at the very back of the stage, there might be a semblance of a wooded glen or yeah. a frontage of a house. Lutherberg used different materials, he'd used translucent materials, which means that they could actually move a lantern up behind the cloth to make uh, it look as if the moon was rising. Yes. Uh, that so, was yeah. part of his realism and his naturalism, not just in his own performances, but the presentation of, of the, the whole thing. thing. And that was all a completely different and a new experience. And presumably people then saw that as an attraction. Garrick understood how to put on a show. He understood that audiences wanted spectacle and surprise, but also Garrick quite cannily knew the importance of self-promotion, capitalizing on the explosion of print media at the time. The v and holds a vast collection of Garrick prints, including his Richard III, as captured by one of the most famous artists of the era, William Hogarth. And so this, this was published in 1746, Six. and it says, Mr. Garrick in the character of Richard III, Shakespeare, Act Six. 5, Six. Scene Six. 7. And, and Hogarth complained about the difficulty of, of painting Garrick because his face changed so much, because he had all these... It was so expressionless. It was so, yes, he oh. had to keep trying and trying again to capture uh, Garrick's it's likeness. Because the other, the other interesting thing was that because Garrick knew, knew so many of the artists and he moved mm. in that world, he was painted so much. He was the most uh, painted person after the really? king in, in his age. Yeah, like, extraordinary. You know how many? Over, over, two, oh, over 200. 200 different representations, oh. which were then engraved and etched. 
I mean, Garrick knew the marketability of his own image. These were all part of his celebrity, weren't they? These, these were the equivalent now of endless photographs. Oh, yes. Of course, everyone would have recognised Garrick by <clears> this <throat> time. He was, he was so well known. He was yeah. the George Clooney of his day. Ah. Amongst all these images of Garrick, there is one that is particularly poignant. And this is one that Garrick wouldn't have seen because it was published after his death. It shows Garrick being lifted up from his coffin. By angels. By angels. Into heaven. I mean, taken up to heaven, but calling off on the way. Oh, say hello to Shakespeare. Shakespeare is waiting uh -huh. there with the muse of comedy and the muse of tragedy. And then they'll probably they'll go on up, up to have a high old time. Oh, yes. On, on... It's party time up there, isn't it? Yeah, yes, so they, yes. they needn't worry. <laughs> um, Don't look so sad. He's going to have a lovely time up there. David Garrick died in 1779. He was 61. Ironically, he was about to put on the biggest show he ever staged, his own funeral. There are reports of close to 50,000 tickets being sold to see him lying in state. The cortege stretched from his Southampton Street home all the way along the Strand to Westminster Abbey. Throughout this fascinating journey, I've been keen to uncover the real David Garrick, to find out if he really was the great actor, the great manager, the great showman that I'd heard about. And I have to confess to being rather skeptical. But the truth is, he really was all these great things. He was a man who loved to perform, to write, loved to gossip to entertain. The theatre was at the heart of everything he did, rightly or wrongly. And for me, as a mere actor, that is what this life is all about. The urge, the compulsion to act, and not just the desire to act. It's not enough to want to act. It is the need to act. And I think Garrick had that in spades. In an age before TV and film, Acting was totally ephemeral. There was absolutely no way of capturing the actor's inspiration. But I don't think Garrick's achievements are lost to us. Far from it. They're built into the bricks and mortar of this place. They blaze brightly in the wider world of London's theatre land. They're written into the DNA of the living, breathing tradition that is British theatre. <laughs>